Well, I wish I had better news to share with you today, but somebody has got to talk about this. Now, if you haven't been watching the news lately, it was just recently disclosed by Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury in the United States. And by the way, this is all related to the American Social Security system. You may want to check into the pension arrangement you have with your own country if it's other than the United States. Now, Janet Yellen just announced that currently the the Social Security and Medicare fund is running $175 trillion below budget. Now, that does not mean, I want to make it very clear, that does not mean that the Social Security and Medicare budget are at zero and we're $175 trillion below that. That's not, that's not what's happening. It's not a deficit in that sense. What has happened is that the current current state of affairs is the entire total budget for Medicare and Social Security. We have some of it right now, but we're still $175 trillion short. So look at it in that context. Still not very good news. So what I want to do here today is cover three things. One, the current situation. Number two, what sort of things may be done in order to correct the problem. And then number three, how this affects you as an expat. Now, to give you an idea of just how much money $175 trillion is, in order to come up with that much money, if you're thinking that a small tax hike might take care of it, it would cost every American household roughly $1.2 million each. Every household in the United States would have to contribute $1.2 million in order to put the Social Security Medicare fund back to where it's supposed to be. Now, to give you an idea of how we ended up where we are now, we can look back both 40 years ago as well as as recently as the last four years for the answer to that. A lot of people have been under the misconception that during our younger years, and I'm talking about my generation, when we started working at 17, 18, 19 years old, and they started taking money out for our our social security, half from our employer, half from ourselves, from our check, many people were still under the old misconception that this money was being put into a trust fund, which prior to about 1980, that was kind of the arrangement. It had its own, it wasn't really a trust fund, it was more like a separate portion of the budget that was not to be touched. However, after 1980 or so, that money, which we were all thinking was untouchable, started getting dipped into by different administrations. Congress wanted money, needed money, and they said, well, we're not really going to take it from Social Security. We're just going to borrow it. So what they did was they, over the years, over the last 40 years, they've been scooping money out of Social Security and Medicare and replacing it with a U.S. government bond. Now, a U.S. bond is basically an IOU that it left with the Social Security Administration. We'll pay you back. Here's our written promise. So then the United States sold these bonds over the years and promised, well, if you buy a U.S. bond for this, let us borrow that money for 10 years. We will give you back this much interest. But here's the problem. As interest rates and inflation go up, the value of the dollar goes down. So what ends up happening is 10 years later, you as the bond investor actually can come out in the negative. You didn't make any money because the rate of interest that you were paid on that bond is less than the rate of inflation devaluing your dollar. To put it another way, if you bought a $10,000 bond in 1980 and cashed it out when it matured in 1990, it's not going to buy you $10,000 worth of groceries. But this is part of the reason why so much money is missing from the Social Security Medicare fund is that it's been dipped into over the years. Now, in the last four years, two other events led to billions of dollars getting siphoned out of the budget. One was for the huge pandemic shutdown. A ton of money went to hospitals to give them extra money for treating these patients. Money was set up for 
all kinds of organizations to inform and enforce and to put out TV commercials and you name it, a ton of money from 2020 to 2022 at the minimum went out of the US government. And that's not even counting in the extra money spent with FEMA in order to prepare for what they thought might be cataclysmic events or something. So you've got that. Billions of dollars wasted away over that whole event. Another thing that happened recently is the current war in Ukraine. I won't go into all the details on how I feel about that, but I'll just suffice it to say that was not money well spent. Billions of dollars went into that money pit and we will never get that money back. But as if all this wasn't bad enough, for decades and even more so in the last three and a half years, Social Security from its fund has been paid out to people who are illegal aliens. They're not residents. They're not citizens. They are people who broke the law in the middle of the night, applied for Social Security benefits for everything from food to health to housing to school grants for their kids. All this money, either within or outside of the Social Security budget, was taken out of the U.S. budget. Billions of dollars that should have gone to the Social Security Medicare fund went to people who never pay taxes. So that's how we got to where we are today. $175 trillion dollars short on the budget for Social Security and Medicare. Now, factoring into this is another big negative. Our generation, born roughly 1950, 1960, are on the tail end of the baby boomers. Many of us are baby boomers. However, the generation behind us, because that money that we put in over the last 30, 40 years of our working career, that money's long gone. The money that is right now now, today, if you're collecting Social Security, that money is coming from currently employed generation. That is the workforce right now contributing into what they think is their Social Security fund. But it's actually going as a straight shot from their paycheck to your Social Security check. So in reality, the entire thing has turned into a Ponzi scheme where you basically rob people Peter to pay Paul. And because the current generation is in a lower number than our baby boomer population, you've got less of a workforce to provide the money for the greater number of retired people. But that's still not the whole story because back in the 1980s, many people on Social Security, their lifespan was not as long as it is now in 2024. People are living longer. New surgical procedures, medications, people taking better care of their health, they're living longer, which means that in their lifetime, our generation, which outnumbers the previous generation, is actually collecting on Social Security more years than, the, than those who were collecting Social Security in the 1970s, the 1980s, who were passing away at a younger age. By the way, the amount that's recorded, again, not counting FEMA preparations and all that, for the entire shutdown of the pandemic, $5.2 trillion. And we got nothing out of that. Although the pharmaceutical companies, they made a lot of money. The contractors who were selling face masks and face shields, they made a lot of money, but we didn't. So that gives you an idea of how we got to where we are today. So next, what we're going to do is take a look at what are the three most likely solutions that the government's going to take in order to address this and fix it. Because the way things currently stand right now. Social Security and Medicare are each set to pretty much run out of money in the next 10 years or less. So something has to be done. This cannot be a can that's kicked any further down the road. So what are the three most likely options that our government's going to look at? Well, the first possibility is that the government, whatever administration happens to be in charge at the time, is going to decide to charge a higher tax 
on all working persons in the workforce. The people who are paying, like I said, directly into Social Security for current Social Security benefits for the those who qualify, raising the taxes either on general tax, personal income tax, or the amount going specifically to Social Security benefits. No matter which way you slice it, it comes down to trying to solve the problem by increasing the tax. Now, as I mentioned before, when I gave you an idea of how much $175 trillion is, raising taxes is not going to cut it. It's only going to kind of, sort of, slightly throw some pennies into the bucket. Now, the second option that might be considered by the government to fix this problem will be if we can't raise more money, then just reduce the benefit. And this could mean reducing the benefit by as much as 23, 25%. So if a person was getting 1,000, let's just say, for example, $1,000 a month in Social Security, one way to try and balance this budget out would be to tell them from now on you get $750 a month. Make it work. Now you can imagine whether it's raising taxes or cutting benefits, neither one of these options is going to be very popular for any senator to be pushing if they want to keep their career. Now the third option is really not much better. The way you could balance the budget is to raise the retirement age, essentially hoping that a portion of those who would otherwise collect Social Security at age 62 would pass away and collect nothing because a portion are going to die before the new mandated minimum age for collecting benefits. What would that be? They might say, well, you need to be at least 64 years old before you can collect Social Security benefits and Medicare. They can make it whatever age they think the math works for. It could be you can't get Social Security until you're 66, 68, 70. But again, this is an idea that was floated in France not long ago. They just wanted to raise the retirement age by two years, and there was rioting in the streets. So that begs the question, whether they decide to raise the amount of taxes on the working generation, or cut the amount of benefit to those who are retired, or raise the retirement age to collect benefits, it's going to be a hard sell in the political arena. It's similar to being told, well, there's three jars here, and in each jar is a poisonous snake, some more than others, but the decision is which jar jar are you going to stick your hand into? None of these are great options. And the sad thing is, it could have been prevented by sticking to a budget and cutting out wastes of money. But this was never done by the people we elected who had no problem voting in favor of unlimited terms for themselves. They had no problem voting for an increase in salary for themselves. They had no problem passing bills that would benefit themselves. Nobody had the balls to go over the budget and start cutting out all of these different consultants and board members that just happen to be relatives of those in Congress doing a nothing job, showing up at a meeting once a year and getting paid million dollar salaries for this. All because it was shuffled into a bill that had nothing to do with anything else. And now you and I have to figure out how we're going to do our part to help the government balance out the Social Security Medicare budget due to their bad management. So this brings us to the third item. How does this affect you? Well, as I mentioned before, we've got about nine to 10 years before critical mass comes to the front door, knocking and banging, saying, hey, there's no more money. So that gives you a little bit of time to think what you're going to do. Now, one thing you might have as an option is to use these next five to 10 years to invest what money you have, whether that be the equity in your home or your savings or your retirement 
your self-directed IRA, whatever it is, one possibility is you think to yourself, how can I safeguard my savings? And how can I best invest this money so that five to 10 years from now, I'm beating inflation and I have something to supplement my social security? That's one thing you can consider doing. I'm not gonna give you any specifics. I'm not here to give you financial advice. You're your best bet is educate yourself. There's plenty of information from investing channels on YouTube, or you could sit down with a CPA, get a consultation, tell him what you got to work with, ask him, well, what kind of return am I looking at when it comes to the traditional markets, real estate, precious metals, crypto, whatever. Recently, uh, Bitcoin ETFs have come onto the market, and that's another option. But again, whatever you decide, the point is you want to take the savings you have and invest it so that Social Security is not the only income that you're relying on in your retirement. Now, it should go without saying that another thing you can do is lower your cost of living. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do this. One way of lowering your cost of living would be to look at the home you're currently in, if you own a home, and look at how much mortgage time you still have left on that. If your mortgage is going to overlap into your Social Security earnings time, you may want to think to yourself, maybe I should sell this house and downsize to a smaller place. A smaller place that you could pay for so that you no longer have a mortgage payment. That is one possible strategy of lowering your cost of living and staying in the United States or country where you are currently from because you really don't have any control over the costs of goods and services. Grocery prices are gonna be what they're gonna be and I don't expect them to go down anytime soon when you have a dollar that is being deflated practically on a weekly basis. Same thing with utilities, same thing with services. I don't see any of that getting any cheaper over the next 10 years. But what you can do is try to eliminate or refinance so that your cost of lodging is no longer one third of your budget. For many of you, your mortgage or apartment rental lease amount is already beyond 33% of your budget, and that's not good. Now, the other option, which again, there is no one answer fits all. I'm not here to say you can fix all this by moving to the Philippines. That is not for everybody. Not everybody is cut out to be an expat living in another country. Now, now, the cost of living in the Philippines or Thailand or Vietnam or Cambodia are much cheaper than living in the United States. That much you know. But are you cut out to be a full-time expat? Another thing to keep in mind, and again, this applies to U.S. citizens, is that your Medicare is not usable in the Philippines. In fact, other than a few small territories like maybe Guam and Puerto Rico, your Medicare is meant to be used in the United States. So you would have to factor in your health insurance if you're going to live abroad. That has to become a necessary part of your budget. Either you have enough money to self-insure because the medical costs are lower in Southeast Asia, which is a good thing, or you don't have that much in savings and what you need to do is have a health plan in place to offset the costs if and when you're gonna need medical care. Now, if you're not in the United States, you need to also check with your country's pension plan to see if they have requirements that you return to your home country every so many years or months in order to maintain your pension. That's a concern that, again, you can only look into that for your own country. I don't really have the time or resources to look up every major country and their requirements. So that's something you need to talk to your pension plan administrator. If I move out of my country to live in the Philippines, how will that affect my pension? How will that affect my taxes? But either way, it boils down to this, and I'll summarize here. Social Security can no longer be counted on 
to be the sole source of income for your retirement. It's better than a poke in the eye, but even if a person is getting 1,800 US dollars a month in social security, in the United States, that doesn't go very far. It won't even get you by if your mortgage is 1,200. That leaves you $600 a month to live on. Good luck with that. You may be able to lower your cost of living if you happen to have a good relationship with your now adult kids and one of them is willing to take you in. Well, now you don't have to worry about a mortgage and your social security could actually just contribute to the grocery budget and etc. for your adult child and his family. That's another route to go to reduce your cost of living. But as tempting as it may be to kick this can down the road in your own mind and tell yourself, oh, gee, that's a real buzz kill. I don't want to think about that. I'll think about that in five years. Well, now you've got even less time to invest or make changes that could help you out. Think about what you can do to supplement your income. Could you learn a new skill? Could you do some work online? With the goal being that between Social Security and whatever else you got going, you've got enough to live at least the comfortable lifestyle that you would like to live, whether it's in your home country or living abroad in Southeast Asia. Again, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I feel I would be remiss to not let you know this is something that needs to be thought about. So interested in your thoughts in the comments and I'll see you there.